My name is Charles Spanger. I'm from Scarborough, Maine, and uh, I'm uh, I uh, participate in uh, activities with uh, 350.org, uh, a climate climate action organization. And uh, I'll just speak very briefly about that. Um, I'm very concerned about the ISDS and uh, and the sovereignty issue. And uh, I think about Maine and uh, the the uh, historical historically uh, significant notion of home rule, it's just farcical in the, pre in the face of this um, home rule. Think about what that means, you know, local rule, state rule, national rule. It's corporate rule we're talking about here, international corporate rule. And I'll take uh, elective sovereignty anytime over unelected sovereignty by people whose only motive is to make money, make profit, and vote there. So I think it's just absurd that this is even being considered and certain. Absurd that our president is pushing it so hard. Okay, I'll, I'll say no more about that. And um, I'm really here because I was asked to uh, present um, the testimony of Nisha Swinton, who is uh, 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 the head staff for Food and Water Watch. And I'm going to read her testimony. Food and Water Watch is located in Portland. Uh, she's unable to be here today. Uh, the TPP poses unacceptable risks to Maine consumers, coastal communities, and local food systems. The controversial trade deal is promoted as an export generating model that will provide more markets and consumers, but this rosy optimism ignores competition from TPP imports, including 1.8 billion pounds of seafood and fish from TPP partners <coughs> in 2015 alone. More importantly, the TPP is more about establishing a global framework of corporate interests to push an, aggr an aggressive deregulatory agenda that is about international, uh, than it is about international cargo. Uh, the 2,700-page TPP text conceals many provisions designed to promote the transnational corporate effort to roll back common sense safeguards that protect Maine workers, communities, the environment, public health, and consumers. Maine's seafood industry is a case study in the risks of the TPP. The deal is promoted as a way to increase lobster exports to wealthy consumers in TPP countries. But few consumers in Malaysia, Peru, Vietnam, Chile, and Mexico are able to buy the expensive delicacy. And our lobstermen also face import competition that could make an often precarious industry more vulnerable. We already import more lobster than we export and the TPP will likely increase the flow of imported lobster. In 2015, the United States exported 73.7 million pounds of lobster to TPP countries, but we imported 125.7 million pounds of tea to, uh, from TPP members. These are farm-raised lobsters, you know, without the claws. Um, the TPP will only increase the volume of imported lobsters especially lobster raised on industrial scale fish farms that often use chemicals and drugs that are banned in the United States. First, the TPP eliminates a 10% tariff on several types of imported processed lobster, making it cheaper to ship lobster to America. Second, the investment provisions encourage building industrial scale fish farms. Already, Malaysia, a TPP nation, is building the world's largest lobster farm, backed by venture capital and aquaculture specialists. This facility aims to cover 23,000 acres, employ 12,000 workers, and produce 40 million pounds of lobster annually. That cheaper lobster with shorter shipping times would compete with main exports to other TPP countries and find its way to the United States. The TPP nations, Vietnam and Malaysia, have significant fish farming export industries. Vietnam is the third largest seafood exporter to the United States, and Malaysia is quickly ramping up too, as the recent lobster farm attests. Fish farmers who raise lobster and other products in overcrowded and dirty ponds often resort to antibiotics and fungicides that are illegal in the United States. Lobster exports from, the, from these two fish farming countries are already rapidly rising. 
In 2015, Vietnam and Malaysia exported more than 100,000 pounds of lobster products to the United States, five times more than the two countries exported in 2012. The TPP would only increase the flow of lobster and other seafood that competes with the catch from Maine's coastal communities, including farmed clams, crab, shrimp, scallops, and more. These imports can lower the price lobstermen receive and make it harder for them to make a living. This is not a theoretical problem. In 2010, the federal government certified that more than 2,400 Maine lobster, lobstermen were economically damaged by imports under prior trade deals. The increased volume of lower quality lobster can turn people away from all lobster when problems are found, as has happened with tainted shrimp and catfish imports in the past. But the TPP also poses considerable risk to consumers, especially seafood consumers. The TPP would unravel and undermine important consumer protections and food safety rules that make trade literally a kitchen table issue. The TPP explicitly prioritizes the flow of commerce ahead of ensuring the safety of imported food. The TPP food safety rules are tougher than our prior trade, uh, trade rules, and uh, exporting countries could successfully challenge U.S. safety standards as illegitimate trade barriers. Broad air areas of our domestic laws and regulations, including food safety standards, border inspection, and lab testing, would be more vulnerable to challenge at international trade tribunals. By the way, who appoints these tribunals, these three-person panels? Does anybody have a clue? Yes, who? One is the, the company that's suing. One is the government that's being sued, and then together they pick the third. The Food and Drug Administration is increasingly concerned that farmed fish imports contain illegal drug and chemical residues that can cause cancer, allergic reactions, and contribute to antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And since the FDA inspects only about 2% of imported seafood, these hazards can easily enter the food supply. Even with this low level of inspection, the FDA, FDA has stopped more than 1,000 shipments of imported lobster over the past decade that was tainted with salmonella or was too filthy to enter the U.S. food supply. These border inspectors and government lab tests are the last line of defense protecting consumers from unsafe imports. But a new provision in the TPP would allow exporters like Vietnam and Malaysia to second-guess U.S. border inspectors who uh, hold a, susp a suspicious seafood shipment at the border. TPP members are allowed to review border inspectors' decisions, a new power in the TPP, not in any prior trade deals. This would further weaken the already inadequate border oversight and force rigorous safety inspection to take a back seat to speeding imports to supermarkets and restaurants. This can put all of us and all of our families at risk to uninspected, potentially tainted foods. The TPP goes, uh, poses far greater risks than opportunities for both fishermen, uh, than opportunities for both fishermen and consumers. But the TPP's impact on Maine's coastal <coughs> communities is only the tip of a very dangerous iceberg. Maine's manufacturing workers could see their jobs, and there's a whole section on this that I'm not going to read because it's already been discussed. Uh, efforts to strengthen local food systems uh, uh, through farm to school and buy local programs, as well as other government procurement efforts, could run afoul of ongoing TPP negotiations. The community efforts to stop foreign water bottling firms from mining Maine's water could run up against investment rules that would allow foreign companies to sue for damages if communities blocked efforts to build water bottling plants. And this is particularly relevant to Maine where this has been a political battle and communities have prevailed when they didn't want their water extracted by uh, uh, large American bottlers. The TPP would seemingly prohibit their ability to fight back. Uh, these are the real impacts of the TPP on Maine's economy, community, fishermen, environment, and consumers. The rosy promises are unlike to materialize, but based on prior trade deals, we know that Maine will feel the painful fallout of the TPP. It means fewer jobs, more inequality, an imperiled fishing sector, more tainted foods, and allowing international business interests to overrule our local communities. 
Thank you. Senator Volk and members of the commission, my name is Harlan Baker. I'm a resident of Portland, Maine. I should add, I'm a former legislator. I think we crossed swords many times, Sharon, in the past. Um, I'm also a socialist. I'll be very brief. I know that's a cliche up in Augusta. But what troubles me the most about this treaty is it's being fast-tracked. We do not have the opportunity to make an amendment. And I've never heard of a, a, a bill where you could not amend. Now, I, I'm not against trade, but I'm against a, a treaty that uh, doesn't allow you to uh, make amendments when there are problems with the treaty. And one of the biggest problems that has been pointed out here tonight is the IDSD part of the treaty, which allows foreign governments to uh, sue the United States. And if they are successful in their suit, who's going to pay for that? It's us, the taxpayers. That's all I really have to say tonight. Thank you. I think I'm signed in. Um, hello. Um, uh, my name is Richard Rames. Um, I farm the ground where I grew up in Bitterford, southern Maine, where all the rich people live. <laughs> uh, unless you're a farmer. Uh, or unless you're like a lot of the people who live in Bitterford that have been hammered by uh, deindustrialization. Um, lack of opportunity, that's the nice neoliberal word that, that is on everybody's tongues these days. Um, I quickly looked at the report that I guess is the basis of the discussion here today. Um, somebody earlier used a, the term cherry picking and that's what it looked like to me. Uh, I was interested that in the discussion about um, so-called free trade and tariff policy in the United States, the, the chart that I saw began about 1890. Well, uh, according to the history that I'm familiar with, the, virtually the first act of the new Congress after the Constitution was adopted was a, a tariff bill. Uh, and as some WAGs have, have noted that if it were not for protections of, of tariff bills, that the United States would still be um, basically pursuing its relative advantage in the fur trade. <laughs> the United States industrialized behind a tariff wall like all industrial economies. You, you, you started at 1890, that's around the time when, we, when, American, when America uh, officially became, uh, began to pursue imperial aims. Uh, Mark Twain and a bunch of people that are now forgotten actually formed the Anti-Imperialist League. And yeah, we began clubbing open the doors of other, other countries that didn't have the kind of military power that we did. That game is still going on, but now it's moved on to this, to this other level. And I think the old song was, some will rob you with a, with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. This is the fountain pen. Uh, I was pleased to hear Randall Parr's use of the word power, a word that has been used very little here today, but explains virtually everything that's going on. Um, the whole point of not only this so-called free trade deal, but the ones that have preceded it, 
is to basically take away power from a theoretically sovereign people and place that power in the hands of unelected, though financially powerful, interests. Now, if that's the few, I mean, how's that working for everybody? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get it. You know, we, we hear in the, in the presidential, the, the form around the, uh, the presidential campaign that there's all this anger out there. Gee, I wonder why. I wonder why. The egalitarian growth that was, was around and that basically characterized the America that I grew up in, born in 45, right after they dropped the big one, two big ones actually, uh, was a largely egalitarian uh, economic uh, up escalator. And that peaked roughly in 1973. And since then, we've been in rollback mode. And people at the, econo at the heights of the economy have been taking the measure of, of ordinary people and finding them wanting. And they have been being punished socially, economically, psychologically. I mean, this is not, we, we've heard that this is so complex. This is not complex. And ordinary people actually, I think, get it. That's where the anger comes from. I'm angry as hell. I'm here today. That's one of the reasons that I'm here. Because I, I, when I come to these august meetings, uh, there was a, a hearing that I taped up in Augusta a few years ago on a single payer bill. One person used the <laughs> word power. One, connected with the labor movement. Hello. I mentioned earlier that I'm a farmer. I've been to Augusta a few times. Uh, when I was growing up, basically, uh, dairy and potatoes were about it in terms of agriculture in the state of Maine. Dairy has largely collapsed. When I was, <clears throat> when I was growing up, there were roughly 100 dairy farms in Biddeford and another 100 over across the river in Saco. I think we have one left in Biddeford and none in Saco. The last one just went out. There are reasons for that. We had public policy, public policy that supported dairy interests, that, that spoke to farm viability. In constant dollars, 100 pounds of milk, Back then, when I was growing up, when there, the, when there were 100 dairy farmers in Bitterford, in constant dollars, that would be roughly $46 a hundred. Today, it's 17 or 18. The Maine Milk Commission, I would encourage anybody who's interested to look at the cost of production studies that the Maine Milk Commission periodically churns out. You know? You, it's not that farmers don't know what they're doing, it's that the system is rigged against them. In Canada, they still have supply management systems for milk, for, for poultry, and eggs. Those are the only profitable sectors of the Canadian economy, uh, agricultural economy, and they are under constant threat from the so-called free trade agreements and the only reason that they still have those, those policies in Canada is because they, got, they took the side door out and they, they were exporting a very small amount of milk products. And the only way they got up from under and were allowed to keep their democratic, democratically arrived at dairy farm viability legislation was that they said, okay, we won't export anymore. They produce solely for domestic consumption. That doesn't mean the pressure has stopped because the pressure is relentless. And ordinary people that are able to feed their faces and to live dignified lives, that is under attack. Those people are under attack. Those sectors are under attack. So, as I say, this isn't particularly 
complicated. I believe that the United States, I haven't checked in dairy stuff in, in a while because, you know, I grow corn and potatoes and no rutabagas anymore. Uh, but last time I checked, I believe the United States is a net importer of dairy. Where's the logic in that? And the prices are crashed because of imports, because we don't have barriers, and milk protein concentrate and these other things are crashing the prices for Maine dairy farmers and farmers all over the country. I live in Biddeford, and there's a lot of Franco folks in Biddeford. And so people periodically go back to Canada. And I hear from folks, there's a farm where I pick berries over in Sanford. The guy got back from Canada a few years ago, and he said, man, it's really weird. You know, you drive around in, in Canada, and all of the barns have paint on them, and there's new tractors in the yard. And then you, you drive across the border into New York State or Vermont or whatever, and the barns are falling down, and, and the tractors are in poor repair. There's, well, there's a reason for that. And so-called free trade deals and, and government abandoning productive sectors of the economy totally explain it. This is not complicated. Uh, this cherry-picked stuff, the, the assault on ordinary people and, the, and, and democratic rights that you've heard from a number of people today, I, I, hope, it, I hope it, you know, has some traction with you. Uh, to continue the agricultural theme, this is a turkey. Thank you. Hi all, uh, my name is Nat Lippert. I'm a student here at USM in the public health program, um, a restaurant worker in Portland and a volunteer organizer with the Southern Maine Workers Center. Uh, my apologies for being late. I've been in class in the evening and so I won't, um, I won't talk at length because I'm guessing that a lot of the folks here have already covered much of what I was gonna say. Um, but I'm bringing, my testimony today is actually from Bjorn Claussen um, so I'm bringing his regards. He served as a commissioner uh, on this commission. Um, and when he learned of today's public hearing, uh, he wanted to share a report with you uh, that he felt was particularly salient. So uh, this was a report of uh, UN independent expert um, Alfred Desaias, um, who's an expert on governance and democracy, um, essentially warning of some of the anti-democratic components of trade agreements like the TPP. Um, and I just wanted to read you a couple quotes from that report, um, which is from, I think it's from the last couple of days. Bjorn also mentioned that coincidentally, um, in some places today, Thursday the 15th, is celebrated as um, International Day of Democracy. So he thought that was interesting. Um, but he wanted to, hi Bjorn wanted to highlight just a couple points from this report from the UN Independent Expert, um, which was published in a, a news release uh, from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and Alfred Desaias said, quote, um, investors and transnational enterprises have invented new rules to suit their needs, rules that impinge on the regulatory space of states and disenfranchise the public. Um, he went on to say, in case of conflict, priority must be given to advancing the public interest rather than continuing the current emphasis on profit expectations of investors and trans transnational corporations. Um, it is high time to mainstream human rights into all trade agreements, uh, as well as WTO rules and regulations, so that trade representatives and dispute settlers know that trade is neither a standalone regime nor an end in itself, which I find compelling. Um, civil society, including consumer unions, health professionals, environmental groups, and other stakeholders, I would add labor unions, uh, must be a part of the process of elaboration, negotiation, adoption, and implementation of trade agreements. And he goes on to address the TPP in particular, 
um, saying, well, saying investor to state dispute settlement mechanisms, uh, the ISDS that's been mentioned, um, basically he says suffers from systemic business bias um, and often fails to consider human rights impacts. Um, and with respect to the TPP in particular, he says uh, this is an agreement that's I'm sure many people have mentioned has been negotiated in secret without consultation of key stakeholders and excluding public participation, thus in violation of Articles 19 and 25 of the International Convention Con Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And this, I think, might be his most powerful quote. Um, None of these treaties have any democratic legitimacy, the expert said emphasizing that none of them should be allowed to enter into force without public referenda, and if they do enter into force, their legality should be challenged before the constitutional courts of the countries concerned and before the regional human rights courts. An advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice reaffirming the primacy of the UN Charter over trade agreements would be instructive, he said. Um, so I wanted to share some of this with you from this recent press release, um, but Bjorn also sent a note just saying that um, you know, one thing that he thought was interesting uh, is that the U.S. is a signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, and he writes, um, you know, that the secret negotiation process of the trade deals violates this covenant or this convention. Um, Article 19 being, everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information of, and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print in the form of art or through any media of his choice. And then Article 25 goes on to say, every citizen shall have the right and the opportunity without any of the distinctions mentioned in Article 2 and without any unreasonable restrictions to take part in the conduct of public affairs directly or through freely chosen representatives. My guess is people have talked about this at length, um, but to me and clearly to Bjorn, um, the anti-democratic principles and mechanisms through which we get the TPP are the most concerning. Thank you. So there are no other members of the public that wish to testify or that um, Karen has some other questions. I'll try to speak through the mic. Okay. Do you want me to use the mic or not? Yeah, yeah maybe because you're kind of soft spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I just had a few other things that um, caught my eye going through the report that I just wanted to emphasize and maybe add just what some of, the, some of this has been touched on, so you know, I won't go into detail. One of the areas was um, touched on by the food and water um, testimony. The report seems to say that the food safety provisions are somehow improved in the TPP over other things and, and they're a, a positive. There's significant um, con, you know, analysis on the SPS or food safety provisions, which comes to a different conclusion, but, you know, um, which includes Food and Water Watch, also you know, Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, but there's others as well. And I would have would like to have seen some of that critique because Basic, and, and it basically um, was quite well, I think, uh, outlined by Misha Swinton. It has a direct, not only is it an impact on public health, but it's also potentially an unfair trade practice, essentially, in terms of the the market for U.S. and seafood is one of the areas where I was hoping we could see a little more detail about the potential impacts on the seafood industry that aren't just about maybe selling a few more lobsters. So I just reiterate that. Um, the other area where you acknowledge that there are likely to be losses in the footwear industry, but said that this could be dealt with by an amendment in the military um, budget provision. Of course, that hasn't passed. Maine is not the only state that has facilities uh, in, in, in contrast to what's said here. Wolverine is another facility that might meet those standards, but I thought it would be useful if you could have gone into some more detail about how many jobs actually are at stake. We have those numbers. It would be good to put some detail in the report um, around the footwear, because that is clearly one that everyone agrees is threatened. Um, there is 
a lot of discussion about services. We've discussed that here. Um, one of the things that caught my eye is that there were some statements made that sort of like, these are things that aren't going to be exported and that uh, there was some mention of um, credit card use in other countries might bump up our telemarketer jobs. And I would just point out that there's been quite a bit of analysis on the liberalization on services within the TPP that in fact would encourage the export of exactly those kinds of jobs, um, which are not tied to location. And many of the service jobs aren't. Obviously working at McDonald's is tied to location, but many of those jobs, including in the healthcare industry where you have radiologists reading, uh, uh, you know, so I think that there could have been more there. And while we're talking about how um, your, your um, focus on biologics on page 45 of your report, I think it's really missing the mark. Um, you quote Thomas Boyke, who used to work for USTR, uh, he is not necessarily the only um, knowledgeable person on um, biologics and intellectual property with medicines. And there's really significant detailed analysis of the TPP and its likely impact on raising drug prices that directly contradicts the one um, you know, report that you referred to. And that would include um, studies by Dr. Deborah Gleaton. Um, and I, I can give you some of these. She's in Australia. Um, there's a study of, by Ellen Schaefer, Dr. Ellen Schaefer, that looked at what happened with the Peru, US FTA, increasing generic drug prices. Um, Jamie Love um, and Knowledge Ecology International is internationally known as an IP specialist and has talked about this. There's reports that have come out by Medicine Sans Frontier or Doctors Without Borders, which focuses very directly on these costs. And specific to Maine, um, you know, the statement is made here that the impact is very small because there's not a lot of um, purchasing of biologics. And this is what would be under these ex extended patent periods, which would essentially give a monopoly pricing, which would be in effect for quite a long period. In fact, the cost of many of these kinds of drugs is an increasing proportion, including of state um, medical bills like Medicaid and government costs. So it's not just about how many drugs there are, but it's also what percentage of the budget is devoted, and it is increasingly a major part, and there's a lot of study about this. And I would point out that, um, going to the question that um, Linda Pissner raised about this, um, sub this um, legislation to implement TPP and does that have other things in it, one of the things that's being discussed is actually trying to increase what's in the TPP by this sort of other means, by changing US law to be a 12-year um, um, timetable for, for biologics. Um, and being under patent. And this is really significant because in the past several years, the Obama administration has actually put in its budget a seven year period <clears throat> for the very reason that this would save Medicaid and Medicare unbelievable amounts of money. So if that were to happen, even though it's not in the TPP specifically, it would actually end up reducing access to health care and um, you know, eliminating the possibility that we could ever change our law in the future. Um, on this issue. So I think that's a whole area around drugs and biologics and the impact on Maine that I think is really um, worth you know, looking at the reports on that take a different view from the reports that you um, cited. Um, and then just finally, um, there's an awful lot of analysis saying that these statements that the labor and environmental provisions are enforceable are really not backed up by the evidence in past agreements and, and in fact, just the value of those. So that is some information that I can certainly send to you. 
it, you know, when I read that, it, it looks a lot like the kind of thing that USTR has on its website saying this is the most enforceable this and that that we've ever had. But there is quite a bit of pretty detailed analysis saying, in fact, that it, the, the reality doesn't really match up to the, the you know, presentation of it. So that is just my final uh, issue that I would just bring up. Um, and, and I also just mentioned specifically the, the drugs, seafood, dairy. Um, these are all issues that the identify and shoes that the commission identified earlier on when we discussed doing this assessment. They are all things that we have done earlier reports on, so that you can go back to those as reference that might be helpful. Uh, you know, it, and it, I think it's something that's been a continuing interest of the commission with the, relating to the TPP um, over time. So. Um, you know, that would just be very helpful to us to, to have your analysis include some of that other material. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope you made notes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I, I like to follow up with some, like, you know, I have some of these documents myself, so I'm happy to follow up with, you know, copies of, of some of those reports that I've mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, I got the names, but please. Yeah, great. yeah. Thank you. And, and by the way, a number of those are peer reviewed. The Deborah Gleaton, you know, these, these are academic papers by serious um, academics. They're peer reviewed, um, and um, sometimes you have to pay for a copy of them as a result. Thank you. Does anyone else have any last comments or questions? Or please? Nope. Well, thank you very much. Recognizing the limits of a study that's $10,000, we appreciate that you needed to narrow the focus and um, that you're willing to look at a couple other things, and um, we appreciate your work. Thank you. And thank you to the public for coming. Right. I guess. Um, Bob, do you have any additional business for us? Can I ask a question on process? Sure. I mean, where do we go from here? Because it seems to me that when we get a final, re I assume we're going to get a final report, but then we should probably need as a commission to go over that. And at some point, we may be taking a position on the TPP. <coughs> um, Everything I hear is that President Obama is going to bring it up in the lame duck. So, just saying. Uh, if we, <laughs> it's still relevant, <laughs> what we think. Well, does it make sense that we need to meet again before the election to make some kind of recommendation? It does not make sense to me, <laughs> personally. I, I don't know, but I mean, you know, laying up is after the election is when, if it does come up, and everything I'm hearing is like this is the chance to do it, so they're going to try to do that. If we want to make a recommendation, we would have to do it before that happens. Now, I assume they're not going to meet the day after the election. So, you know. But. Yeah. Well, the matter of whether you're going to meet again or take action is, that's up to the commission itself. I, I really can't comment on that other than what I just said. I also want to emphasize in listening to everything and, and all the reports that were cited, almost all of them or a, a huge majority of all this literature is available already on our website. Um, I don't know how many, how many people read these things, but <laughs> I do this summary, articles of interest every few months and I write a brief summary, just a few sentences but I include the whole article. And, and so um, a lot of this information is on our website and there's a tremendous amount of information that could be used by everyone. And it, I just want to make a point that it's there. And uh, <clears throat> the other thing is that anyone can contact the commission through me, there's a, um, there's a link that if you have more testimony or comments that you want to send in, just look for the link on our home page and you can send it, it comes to me, and I'll make sure that the commission sees it. 
But part of the commission's duty is to share this information publicly. And I, I'm just stating emphatically, it's all there if you want to go look at it. So that's all I had to say.